So my uh, thesis work is on association logging and scaling algorithms for enhancing social and fairness in wild Filipino world. And uh, here is the outline of my presentation. First, I'll give a brief overview of wild Filipino world and then present the end-to-end -end performance based association we designed for ATD level wireless material works. And then we, uh, and in the th uh, third part of uh, my talk, I have uh, discussed a fair bandwidth allocation in wireless material works to find the um, optimal performance of the network. And in the fourth part, I focus on multi-channel manual wireless material works to address uh, channel assignment, stream control, and scheduling. And uh, um, last, I, I'd like to conclude my work and organize some future work. Uh, in wireless mesh network, uh, there are three types of nodes. Gateways provide internet access uh, to the users, while uh, wireless mesh routers uh, forward, uh, forward traffic and act as access points for uh, users in their coverage. And also, there are some users either mobile or stationary. And accordingly, there are uh, three types three types of links. In internet access links, collecting gateway and uh, internet and intermesh wireless links uh, collect uh, mesh routers and also user access links collect the user and uh, 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 user access links collect uh, users to um, mesh routers or directly to gateway. So the mm, most common case traffic in wireless mesh network is a user internet data traffic. So the other, the, the other type of uh, traffic, user to user um, traffic is less common. So wireless mesh network is uh, undergoing a rapid progress and uh, inspiring a lot of applications such as uh, shared broadband internet access, emergency response, mobile internet access, and broadband home networking. So these emerging applications um, poses abundant research topics uh, spanning from data layer to application layer, uh, plus the network management and security. In this, in our thesis work, we address some issues uh, in map layer and the network layer. And the research problems uh, most related to our work uh, include gateway selection uh, in, in presence of multiple gateways, uh, gateway workload and wireless paths, collecting gateways to internet, uh, make distinction between gateways, and also access point selection is important. Uh, user access link and wireless path collecting AP to the selected gateway makes some APs more preferable than the others. Uh, and also cross-layer uh, cross routing, um, um, because, uh, awareness of underlying conditions make cross-layer routing reflect that point more precisely. And uh, the last map scheduling is uh, important because um, a carefully designed scheduling algorithm can lead to more efficient evaluation of channel resources. Okay, so uh, now we turn to the first part of our um, the association mechanism for wireless machine works. In this part, we develop an uh, end to end performance based association mechanism for wireless machine works. So, as we just mentioned, mesh traffic is predominantly destined to gateway, and thus the level of the end to end performance is the most important performance criteria. So, current association mechanism. Uh, Originally designed for wireless demand, a lot suitable for wireless mesh networks because they only take access in the quality as a as a, a considered consider factor. In contrast to high speed wireless backbone or wireless LAN, wireless LAN backbone is uh, bandwidth limited. So it's uh, equally important to incorporate backbone conditions into um, association process. So when you say access in quality. Um, the, um, it includes some uh, like uh, channel quality, the uh, um, number of users, uh, and all it, which can impact the throughput of the users on the link. And um, association for classic ATP level wireless LAN have been researched extensively. And in these previous works, um, uh, one or more link attributes are considered for evaluating a user access link. These factors include channel quality, channel access competition, load balancing, and the number of users currently associated. Um, and association and panel for wireless network 
have received much less attention. And in uh, this work in 2005 and 2007, the proposed uh, association mechanism for forecast so as to minimize the participation at this point. And also in Halstead's work in 2006 and the proposed scheme uh, which supports collaboration between access points to uh, facilitate handoff. So these works consider some aspects of wireless network characteristics, but the problem is association decision is based only on uh, user accuracy. And the multi-hop characteristic of large machine work uh, determines the delay and congestion of the data paths between access points and gateway is important. So in this work, we um, attempt to uh, uh, make a more wise uh, selection of user access link and also incorporate the multi-hop characteristic of wireless machine work into the association process. So we first um, uh, developed two uh, user access link metrics. Uh, the first one is uh, called Transition Aware Expected Transmission Time, or CAEPT for short. And the definition of CAEPT captures uh, channel quality and channel access competition, number of users, and the fair band bandwidth allocation of 8 to 11 when users are backlogged. And uh, uh, when users are backlogged, um, uh, the users uh, equally share the bandwidth. So the sum of uh, packet size over rates uh, lower bounds the channel access time. Um, so, uh, and channel error uh, may fail the transmission and uh, the, uh, some pack packets may get retransmitted. So given the uh, packet error rate E and I, uh, the one over one minus E and I represents the average number of uh, retransmissions. So combine, uh, combining this uh, factor together, see if you get lower bounds the expected transmission time per user and to send a packet successfully. Um, so, so math is? Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, math is match of this point. Because we, um, um, generally we call it uh, mesh routers, but here because we focus on association, so we just uh, uh, use the mesh access point to uh, em emphasize this functionality at the access point. So yeah. in this in this metric, you don't uh, consider time distribution to collision and stuff. There will be some time that will be because of collisions, right? right? So yes. Not So in this case, you are assuming that uh, you have. If you, if you say I don't see that that being taken into account in this. Is there some way you are taking that into account? Like basically, I have to take account for all. See, in the in the case it's of the a average. No, no, no. But in the case of a TDMA kind of system, mm -hmm. um, this would probably be the be the expected transmission time. And then I would take some kind of error metric. But in the case of a CSMA system, you'll have to worry about cases where a certain collision is taking place, and you really cannot stop the collision. So we don't. Uh, we do. We do not consider the collision here. So this is why we just call it its lower bound. It's not the actual transmission time needed by the user. It's just a look uh, of the lower bounds without consideration of um, collision between users' transmission. So the loss rate is just having to do with with uh, on the on the channel on a, on a clear channel. Yeah. And the uh, CEPP is designed based on the observation that uh, with an insaturated network, uh, users <coughs> also equally share the bandwidth. So it, sorry, it may. Sorry, sorry. Go back. Go back. <laughs> it, so it may. Okay. Um, that summation. Could you just explain that to me? I understand the ratio, but I think it's unclear to me. It's a um, dumb question. Why you that's this one? Yeah, 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 yes, exactly. Yeah. This one, okay. So, because when users are backlogged, users equally share the bandwidth uh, in A to the level. So, the, so on average, each, each user will get a chance to transmit a packet uh, before a user can grab the channel again. So, on average, if, if there are like n users, maybe in some, you can uh, think, think of it as uh, a, a schedule of uh, so like for instance in the sub method which I can share 
Okay, so uh, J, uh, is, is it a user? Uh, J is the uh, user. Wait, uh, okay, so the CI is the set of users currently associated with access point I. And uh, the N is the new user which is scanning the channel and want to associate with this, uh, this, this uh, access point. So we, ju we just, uh, um, so for each user, we get S over RG and sum it together to estimate the uh, channel access time. Sorry, I think I read that wrong. Because I, I was thinking, oh, S over R is kind of the, the transmission time for, for, the given user. for a given user, right? If the, if the, the test packet is like S and the rate is R. Um, then S over R is sort of the, the time that the packet is being transmitted. Yes, this is exactly the time because uh, uh, this, uh, this I said, um, each user will get a, a chance to transmit the packet before they can uh, get grab the channel again. So between two, uh, between two uh, access to access to the channel for a, a given user, there are n users transmission in between. So this is. So the idea is that they get turned, and this so this time is the kind of the time it takes for everyone mm -hmm. who's using an access. This is a, it's a pseudo TDNA system in the sense that it's ordered. So that's that kind of thing. Like or at least the metric is the right. Right. But isn't like the packet loss rate different for different users? Like shouldn't that be inside um, the sum and be different for different? Yeah. Like doesn't it have a J in it? Yeah, but um, when users uh, con um, contend for channel access and uh, on no matter uh, the transmission from other uh, another uh, user is uh, su successful or or not, it will occupy the channel this this much time. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying so you get a turn and maybe if it's yeah. a failure, yeah. you have a whole other cycle of this yeah, amount right. of time until you get another chance. Yes. And uh, um, the um, problem with CMT is it doesn't uh, incorporate the actual traffic in the matrix. So to account for this, we de uh, define another uh, access link metric uh, called load aware link transmission time. So the LETT uh, is dependent on the calculation of the effective bit rate. So EPR um, is defined as the amount of traffic that can be successfully delivered of the link in unit time. So when channel is uh, uh, lightly loaded, the, we can measure a very large idle list ratio lambda. So in this case, the idle part of the channel is sufficient to support uh, the new traffic without um, or interfering with uh, existing traffic in, on, uh, in this uh, network. Um, so the EBR is defined as the uh, if, uh, one minus uh, E times uh, idle list ratio times the uh, link capacity. So the question is, is this formula, uh, is this formula ap applicable to the saturated case? The answer is no. And an extreme case is uh, when lambda i is equal to zero. Instead of getting zero throughput, the user n will equally share the bandwidth with other users in current uh, uh, set. So, um, so the if we, uh, so the definition of EBR in this case reflect, reflects this um, uh, equal sharing of bandwidth. So this uh, the, this fraction term here is the um, is the upper bound of the per user throughput. However, due to conditions or uh, contentions, uh, a user can never achieve this bound. So we just define a theta, which is a fraction number between uh, zero and one, to estimate uh, the actual per user throughput. So in this case, the uh, EBR is, is, uh, is defined uh, this way. And the la uh, lastly, we define the LEDT as the uh, packet size over EBR. So we just uh, uh, convert the um, uh, rate conception to the time conception to be consistent with um, most uh, pro proposed uh, routing metric will be 
is in the end-to-end uh, -end component phase of regulation. One second, I don't understand your argument that that formula is not applicable to the saturated phase. Okay, so on, so, uh, okay, so we just take the extreme case when um, lambda i equal to zero, this means the channel is completely occupied. So there is, so the uh, network is saturated. And when a user, in this case, if a new user joins the network, it, it um, if we uh, uh, if uh, if we just use this uh, formula, we can uh, the PPR will be zero. Is that right? If it's completely saturated. Yeah, but if, if this user did uh, actually join the network, it will it will share the bandwidth with other users, not the zero throughput, because this is this is because of the um, MAC mechanism used by the IP level. So it. So instead of zero throughput, we will share the bandwidth with other users. And implicitly, there's some notion that all of it really is fully utilized and saturated, right? Mm -hmm. The the other people um, will will take kind of infinite time to do their business. They'll never make any room for mm -hmm. them to be person A. If they if somehow there's a protocol that somehow lets the new person have some space, mm -hmm. right? Then the other people weren't really saturating their channel. Like they, they maybe you know, they were maybe transmitting using some kind of variable rate scheme that allowed them to back up. But they were just. Uh, so we're just saying your notion of oh, it, that just means it wasn't really saturated. So so it's 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 maybe a uh, being picky. But I think the the thing that is in any room in in this exact case is really the ability. Of in the long term, when this channel starts going so back and forth. Okay. okay so, so, okay, so your proposal was to use a, a, a test packet divided by EDR. Yeah. And, and this is your your proposed method. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the other one was maybe a test packet. Something to compare against that other people have done. Mm -hmm, yeah. And now with uh, as many still uh, there is a, a, a theta in here, and we use uh, we use uh, simulations uh, to estimate the theta. So we simulate um, uh, access point with the number of users uh, placed around it, and we uh, change the number of users from five to forty. And for each number, we randomly generated 10 topologies uh, and measured the uh, ratio between the actual uh, throughput uh, to the throughput bound. And we give a present result in this figure on the right. And the x-axis is the number of users in, in this uh, network. And the 10 points corresponding to each number is the um, results of uh, with, uh, of the ten random uh, topologies, so we can uh, we can observe that um, the theta stays around forty uh, six and is not in sensitive to the number of users. So in the in the rest of uh, our work, we just use forty um, uh, six to uh, estimate the actual throughput a user can achieve. And now CETV and LETT incorporate more interactive than existing metrics, and uh, they quantify the goodness of a user access link and provide significant improvement in user throughput, which uh, will be demonstrated in the forthcoming slides. And uh, these two metrics can applicable uh, can be applied as uh, association metrics to a wireless net and wireless internet works. Uh, however, still no consider consideration given to the gaps between the mesh access point and the gateway. So we extend the CETP and LAETT based association scheme in a cross layer manner, taking into account information from the routing layer in order to fit it in the operation of a wireless internet works. The association mechanism is based on the uh, user access, 
association metric with uh, uh, called the uh, GSEL. Uh, GSEL is uh, within some of antisemitic quality and the platform have tasks and get, uh, beta is um, uh, weight parameter which is uh, between uh, zero and one. And uh, here is uh, um, an uh, example of our association mechanism. Uh, a laptop uh, a user can uh, potentially associate with three map, uh, three access points, and access um, for H three has a, a best bus uh, to the gateway, uh, while the map two has a, a furthest pass to the gateway. However, uh, access point two provides the highest quality access link. So based on CEP and LEPP, the user will select uh, access point two for association. But the uh, GSO-based association scheme will select uh, AP1. Um, for AP1, either um, either access link or the uh, back, uh, the, the path to the gateway uh, is not the best, but the combined performance uh, is the best. So uh, this is the So, um, the, uh, so uh, for our association mechanism, we first uh, enhance the beacon and probe response uh, frames uh, to incorporate the rate information, rate information of the current associated users and the cost of the uh, pass to the gateway. And also, uh, in these two kinds of frames, we incorporate the traffic load. And then user calculates the packet error rate either based on its R or percentage of the received probing packs in the time window and determine its data rate. And uh, then users can calculate the CEP or LEPP based on its own measurements and receive information from beacon and probe response frames and, and then obtain the GSL with respect to each candidate map. Finally, the user selects the map with the minimum GSL for association. So now we uh, present some um, performance results. And first, we'll uh, evaluate the performance of CEP and LEPP. We simulated a uh, wireless LAN with five overlapping basic service steps. And the placement of access points uh, are shown in the figure. And number of users is uh, either 30 to simulate a moder moderate size network or, uh, or 60 to uh, simulate uh, um, a denser network. <coughs> And we study the throughput and delay performance of CEP and LEP and compare uh, their performance with RSSI, receive sampling strength, which is uh, specified in 8311 8 standard, and the potential gateways, which is representative of, uh, of an existing uh, association metric. So we can see in either case, um, CEPP and LEPP uh, achieves better performance than R RSSI and, and the PDP throughput and delay. So, so, okay. uh, so the axis is always total offered load? Yeah, the x axis is the total offered load. But somehow uh, there's really load at two different access points, right? Mm, yeah. So, is it, how do you decide? Is it, how, how is the load kind of? Sort of divided over the two access points. Mm. Uh, so here we are. Um, so we are here. We assume the um, channel is different. Channel of LEPs are different. So there is no inter interference. So if the user associated with access point, it will operate on a different channel than other other users. Two questions. How do you define the load? Go back to your uh, yeah. big So the definition of load is lambda than. Um, um, the the placement of the of the users. Yeah. No, I mean when you so say load, how do you calculate the protein load? Offered load is the individual load of each node sum. Load. Oh, the sum the sum of the all the all the, all the load. Offered by the yeah. how many the terminals? Yes. So this closed system is equal five yeah. so, so when you do this experiment, you you sprinkle thirty users around around the space. 
Do they have some random way of um, um, making their like? Do they do they do they appear as a plus on process? Uh, 
And we use access link, uh, see EPT as the access link metric and EPT as the route metric. So we can see that um, when the when data takes a, a very small value like zero, so we can observe a very high access link throughput. But uh, the high access link throughput does not imply the high end-to-end -end throughput. This means a lot of traffic um, uh, has been uh, successfully delivered to its associate to the access point, but get lost on the back module to the um, poor performance of the wireless path between the access points to the gateway. And when beta gets, la uh, gets larger, we can, uh, more, ba more consideration is given to the backbone path, and there, uh, and the um, access link throughput and end-to-end -end throughput is um, uh, are getting um, more balanced. So also the access link throughput decreased a little bit, but we can observe uh, the increased end-to-end -end throughput. And we also list the number of users at different frequencies with respect to data. And we can see that when beta um, takes small values, uh, nodes tend to choose uh, access point which can provide um, a high data rate. And when uh, beta gets larger and the distribution of uh, stations of different data rates will become more even. And the last way uh, will compare several associated schemes. And uh, in uh, the first four schemes, um, in, four, in first four schemes, uh, association is based only on access, uh, user access link. And the last three, uh, we use the GSL-based associa uh, association mechanism we, um, we uh, develop. And the first four, we just uh, want to investigate how the uh, um, routing metric and access link metric can impact the end-to-end -end performance. So now you're doing the mesh. So yes. Yeah. And you're doing the multi-hop. Yeah, multi-hop, yeah. And now we, we still simulate the uh, um, mesh network with 31 access point and 120 users and uh, user 811 as the player and also we note that uh, some users in the mesh network, network may, um, may have no traffic to send. So we uh, simulate different ratios of active users to be 30%, 60%, and 100%. <coughs> And still, we uh, uh, cons uh, started the total throughput and direct performance in uh, these uh, three cases. And the uh, x-axis is still the total overload. And on the, right, uh, on the uh, left hand figure, uh, the y-axis of the left, left hand figures are total throughput, and the right one is the delay. So we can uh, just uh, we can roughly see that uh, the group of GSL-based association can. Um, improve the performance in terms of super and delay significantly. Like so, while so, you know, the, the results look good, but that's mm -hmm. kind of like, um, somehow it seemed like maybe I missed this slide that said how, what sort of your physical scenario is. Like, like it's now it's 30 access points and 100. Mm -hmm. So, okay, points. so in, uh, um, um, but there's like, um, so, so the way you introduce the CAEP. It's kind of a one hop metric, right? Yeah. Uh, and and the LAEPT is a one hop metric. Okay. So now you're using these metrics in okay. some, Let me, uh, some multi hop okay. way. Okay. Uh, maybe maybe the, the, you can skip that slide. Okay. So I will uh, describe it a little bit more. So we simulate our, our mesh network in a rectangular area and with uh, 31 maps and uh, 120 users. And uh, Either maps and users are randomly distributed. And among the 31 maps, there is one acting as the gateway. And uh, we, uh, uh, we carefully assign, so we assume there is no industrial interference on the access links. So different uh, uh, mesh access points use different channels, and there is no interference between different uh, maps on the access link side. So, so when, okay, so what's the difference between a map and a gateway? Um, so Not map, all the maps are, before uh, each map was a gateway, right? Um, no, uh, map is a mesh access point, which is a form of communicating infrastructure for users. And only gateways have, uh, only gateways have the wild connection to the internet. 
So all the all the traffic between users and internet has has to go through the big windows. And maybe there are a lot of mesh routers in the beginning. I'm sure you do, yeah. Go back there. Go back. Did I miss the big area? This is the uh, um, bigger. So the wireless mesh route. So the gateway has the wide connection to the internet, and uh, all the users, uh, if, if, if users want to access the internet, then the traffic must go through gateway. Maybe forwarded by multiple mesh routers in between. And for the, everything for for the mobile users, they only go one. They only transmit one hop to yeah. to a mesh access. Point. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and then the mesh access point do something multi hop with diff other mesh access points right. to get to the right. Right. And the channels for yeah. at the mesh access point do are a separate set of channels. Yeah. So we assume uh, in in our simulation we assume there are two uh, uh, radio interfaces uh, on each mesh uh, mesh routers. One is for user access link, and one is for uh, intro mesh link connection. And also on the access side, there is no inter cell interference. And there is on only one channel in the wireless mesh backbone. So, so do you have, um, uh, do you end up getting frequency readings in your mesh backbone? In the sense, like you can have multiple um, mesh uh, access points transmitting at the same time, <coughs> but because uh, they're separated by enough distance, they they both transmit successfully. Like the one in the back, they all oh, transmit at the same time as the one there. Like that link in the back, the mm -hmm. way that could, that can be active at the same time as the link up in the front. Yeah, yeah, even on the same channel, right? Yeah. So this, uh, yes, um, we just use the uh, ATC little map as a right. map layer protocol, so it, um, it enables uh, spatial review. Okay. So can you tell us now how the metric works for the, for, for the association? Okay. So I, I think I have a sense of the one hop transmission, but like somehow it might like it should also depend on if one access point is kind of a faster route, right? Okay, so the um, so okay, maybe I think uh, maybe we can use this yeah, example okay, to good. illustrate this uh, concept. So first, we define the state ATP and LATP to um, qualify the goodness of the user access link. And the end-to-end -end path between the user and the gateway will uh, go across access link as well as go, going through this backbone path between the exit point and the gateway. So we just uh, we propose the ATP and LATP to um, is uh, to uh, as the um, access link metric, and also um, we just uh, incorporate the backbone path. Uh, cost in the association metric. So the association. So, wait, wait, maybe, so, so it seems like you have a lot of choices about how to incorporate the backbone link mm -hmm. cost to the. Okay, so here is the uh, user access link metric, which we use yeah, in okay. wireless mesh networks. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, the first uh, item is access link <coughs> metric, which can be used or which can be measured by CATP or LATP. And the uh, second term is the uh, backbone pass between the access point and the gateway. You can use different metrics, uh, routing metric to measure this CPP. Oh, okay. And then we Beta just, then is yeah. the weighting factor. Yeah. Okay, all right. Somehow, if I you said that earlier, then it's you know, you sorry. You flipped the keys for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think these started off with us. Gotta hurry up before we wait baby thoughts. Right? <laughs> 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 
while satisfying the requirement of minimum bandwidth obtained by solving the first step. And in this formulation, we allow multiple, we allow a fractional association and multiple, multiple um, pass routing. By fractional association, we mean a user can associate with multiple uh, access points. And by multiple, multi pass routing, we, we say that uh, a flow can go along multiple paths to the gateway from the uh, access points. So if we want to limit the uh, association to be input association and has to be single pass routing, then we just simply add two uh, sets of uh, zero one um, uh, variables and uh, limit that one user can only associate with one access point and at each intermediate node on the backbone, there is only uh, one output link uh, uh, for a given flow. So the other question is, um, so another scenario is if we, we are given the, uh, so in, in single pass routing and uh, integral association, another scenario is if we are given the trade technology, uh, how to uh, allocate bandwidth to achieve uh, some performance like maximum fairness. So, uh, in, so in the following, we'll study, uh, study the bandwidth allocation within the predetermined trade topology, uh, which gives the optimal performance of the given topology. And then uh, we observe that for a network, different trade topology results different bandwidth allocation factors. So uh, constructing a good tree can improve the performance. And in the uh, and the last way, just propose um, uh, algorithm for construction and maintenance of an efficient tree. And so the um, problem formulation is just as as before, and uh, in in two steps. First, we maximize the minimum bandwidth allocated, and then we maximize the throughput while satisfying the minimum bandwidth requirement. And to construct an efficient tree, we use an interference aware routing matrix. Uh, the interference aware routing matrix has two components. So one component is the airtime cost, which is defined as the time needed for a link L to successfully transmit a packet to its receiver. And the interference cost represents the total channel time of the interfered uh, links uh, consumed by transmission on link L. So the um, so the pass cost is just the sum of the uh, cost of the links constituting the pass, and uh, on the association we just uh, use uh, on the end-to-end -end performance based association we have just uh, proposed. So I cannot repeat it here. And we note that uh, in the uh, in the um, in the other formulations. The interference constraint requires that uh, the channel utilization of all the links in, in any maximum click should be low greater than one. That leads to find all the maximum clicks, which is computationally intensive. So we uh, so here we just propose a maximum click approximation algorithm. So for each backbone link L, we uh, we denote the set of links that interfere with link L as I L. So we conclude that a maximum click uh, must be contained in at least one set of IL. So we use the IL to approximate the set of maximum clicks. And so the interference constraint um, becomes, uh, becomes uh, requiring that all, all, the link, all the links in, the, in any interference set cannot be active simultaneously, which results in a conservative solution. Maybe we can take uh, this simple example. Oh, C, the C is a capacity, right? What is it? What is C on the denominator? Um, CL is the uh, link capacity of L. Right. Now, just, I don't think you said how is that calculated? Mm, we, well, we assume it's given. The CL, right? Yeah, that depends. There's an approximation going on here. No, we just assume it, it's given. So, so it represents the rate that you can transfer the link L yes. in the absence of the security? Um, but yes, yes. So, so it actually requires that 
uh, the links in the mapping tree cannot be selected, cannot be active simultaneously. Only one link in the mapping tree can translate at a time. So for spatial reasons, you don't see that? Yes, you can see that uh, there, uh, spatial reuse is, is lost in this break of information. Well, uh, well, uh, we are going to address this. So in this example, we um, give a, a concrete graph here, and there are two maximum leaves. Mm, one is one, two, three, and the other one is uh, um, two, three, four. So if if the interference uh, constraint is based on maximum leaves, that means uh, links one, two, three cannot be active simultaneously, and while uh, two, three, four cannot be active simultaneously. But if we construct the interference constraint based on interference set, the approximation approach, we will require that all the links in all the links of one, two, three, four cannot be cannot be active at the same time. This is overstretched and boosts the spatial reuse because in this figure we can see that link one and link four can actually be active at the same time. So there so this will these two um, more conservative uh, results. And uh, um, now we uh, I'm sorry. I'm really curious about the representation of the edge of the Um so there is um so we we define a uh, uh, transmission range and an interference range. And we assume that uh, uh, if um if the if a transmitter is within the interference range of this receiver, it will uh, cause interference on this receiver. Right. Does that, uh, this sort of thing uh, could be in a building, for example, where there is, uh, where energy gets channeled. So you don't consider cases like that. that uh, mm -hmm. no. So it's kind of a free space yeah. approximation and the graph is always plain. Yeah. Okay. So now we uh, will present a scheduling algorithm after solving the uh, uh, flow rot solution RIG. We first calculate the time slot allocated to link L for transmitting flow I with T as the scheduling cycle. Then we gradually schedule a transmission to the first time slot such that it won't conflict with any transmission already in that slot. And this scheduling algorithm is collision free and it get guarantees allocated bandwidth. And also because um, um, scheduling non-interfering transmissions to the same slot accounts for spatial reuse, uh, which may have been lost in, in late approximation. So uh, this scheduling algorithm can at least partially recover the performance loss due to maximum fleet approximation. So here is the uh, example to uh, explain this. We consider a wireless um, mesh backbone with uh, of chain topology, and G is a gateway, and AB, AB is the mesh, uh, mesh routers. So we assume the attentive um, speed recycle is 10 slots, and all the links have the capacity C, and uh, uh, each mesh router has a flow to the gateway. So if we um, so if we construct an interference constraint based on maximum cliques, then the flow routing solution uh, for uh, any link L and any flow I would, would be T over 10. While if we use maximum click approximation, the solution would be C over 10. So with C over 10, then uh, each link will lead one slot for each slot going through this link. So we then we schedule um, then we uh, uh, schedule the transmission. Those uh, numbers on the top are the slot numbers on uh, covering a, a, a scheduling cycle, and the pair on the uh, left is the flow link pair. So, for example, the A1 link, the link one, transmitting uh, traffic for flow from sourced from. Uh, mesh router A. So we start with A1 and assign the first slot to A1. Since link 1, 2, 3 are in the same uh, click, so any trans transmissions on these three links cannot be overlapped. So the nine pairs lead nine slots. <coughs> Last, uh, link 1 and link 4 uh, do not conflict with each other, so we can schedule link 4 into the first 
slot uh, simultaneous with uh, A1. So due to spatial reuse, you know, we just actually we just use uh, speed, uh, we use uh, nine slots, and each flow actually achieves C of nine throughput. So in this case, scaling fully recovers the performance loss due to maximum click approximation. Okay, so now we are uh, uh, present some uh, results uh, for performance evaluation. We first consider the simple control topology, uh, and the uh, backbone topology is uh, is uh, is a trim, and uh, we we uh, use the blue uh, to denote to the eleven megabit link and the red to uh, to denote to the five point five megabit link. And we see that in this case, uh, if uh, if we use a, a law fractional association, then each user get equal uh, bandwidth. Airways and in, in which node, uh, user two and four associated with two access points, while uh, user one and three associated only with only one. So and now we uh, limit the association to be integral association, and the association is based on uh, JSON metric. And then um, because uh, we, when we change the values of beta, we change the uh, logic tree topology. Uh, in fact, so the uh, so the results here show that um, different the, the impact of trace topology on the uh, bandwidth allocation vectors. So we can see that when beta take take value of 0.7 or 0 0.6, it can um, achieve the best throughput in this case. So so uh, uh, for example, if node user two has a, a red link to Yeah. So, so somehow you're saying, oh, it's better if beta is like 0.7 or 0.8. Is, um, that, that's, is that right? Uh, actually, I want to express the uh, uh, observation that uh, the uh, how how the uh, like given tree topology impacts the resulting bandwidth allocation because the routing here is fixed, so we cannot do the things to change routing to, uh, in order to change the tree topology. So we just change the beta to, uh, to uh, get a different association, which means different tree topology. So we can observe the different bandwidth allocation vectors under different tree topology here. So, so uh, do we get other examples? Are there the other examples where somehow data should be 0.4 or somehow is it a topology dependent answer? Yes, you can see the uh, this in this one. So we just uh, uh, also consider a random topology with the broad backbone and the five by three grids and the gateway of the upper right quarter and we ran uh, 25 randomly distributed users and we change the we uh, like we consider uh, beta from 0, uh, 0.1, 0 0.2 up to 1. And uh, we just give several representative values of beta. And we can see that uh, it, the, um, the different beta can, when, when beta is 0, and we can uh, see that the, the files occurs with, uh, in resource allocation. But when we change the beta, uh, the value of beta, we get different bandwidth allocation vector. And when beta takes a value of 0 0.6, we can see uh, the perfect fairness has been achieved while get while maximize the total throughput. So we so from this result we can confident that a good trip topology can increase the throughput without sacrificing fairness. So I think by definition, I think for beta equal to zero, and I think some extent for beta equal to point one or point eight, point one, I think. Um, and, and that for SPA, SPA index twenty five, you have to choose between two things. Which one? At the very right of the plot. Oh, uh, left or right? The left plot, the very right of the left plot. Okay. Uh, so that blue line here, where the blue line here. 
23, it jumps way up. Jumps from point two five to like point uh, point five five. How how do you define the depletion index? So is that the salt piece? Or? Yeah, it, it's solid. In what way? Um, the in the increasing order of uh, bandwidth allocation, allocated bandwidth. So it's just a so it so a new fact is um we just we, I just get uh, the uh, random increase of the uh, allocation uh, bandwidth allocation vector. Then I do the ordering to like frequent the results in like more deeply, I guess. And somehow there's a, a, the the max win coefficient. Yes. But somehow those two or three nodes at the end are the ones who somehow actually got everyone the minimum. They got all the excess bandwidth. Is that right? Yeah. But somehow <coughs> in the case of the, the beta point, the green, somehow there wasn't any excess bandwidth because everybody mm -hmm. got the same thing. And somehow it, for, for beta equals 0.6, it, there never was any excess bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So, so these are averaged over 25, I don't know, they're no, just no, averaged it's over any, it's one? It's one just one attainment. Okay. It's just one attainment. And the last way of uh, uh, investigating is the impact of logarithmic approximation and scheduling. And in, uh, in, in the last figure, we just uh, compare the uh, like optimal solution to the different uh, bandwidth allocation scheme. The MTB we have not mentioned is a maximum throughput bandwidth allocation. So the goal is to maximize the uh, uh, throughput. And then the red one represents the uh, maximum bandwidth allocation, and the blue one is the um, uh, maximum bandwidth allocation with the tree given. So we can see that when the um, maxim, maximum throughput is the goal, and then we can see a zero bounce in the resource allocation. Um, and in the right figure, we just can, uh, the uh, blue one is the optimal solution to the MMBH tree problem. And the uh, black one is the uh, MMBH tree with less than the uh, with click, a uh, maximum click approximation. We can see that because, because click approximation uh, lose some spatial reuse, we can see a uh, uh, large decrease in the performance by a click approximation. And then the, the green one is the, uh, re, the, the uh, final results with scheduling. We can see that because uh, in scheduling, we can schedule non-interfering uh, links to the same slot. So it can um, uh, recover the performance loss due to uh, maximum click. So in this case, the performance loss is not uh, completely recovered, but uh, but for most uh, users, it uh, achieves the uh, throughput, which is the optimum values. Okay. So in the third part of our work, we focus on multi-channel MIMO wireless mesh networks and address channel assignments, field counter, and scheduling. And the interference. Uh, I just better say, you know, the, um, uh, because of our, our previous department schedule, uh, I, you know, I had an eight to five, so I'll just manually wrap up by the more clarity here. That's the whole thing. Okay. Explain the main concept. Yeah, I'll focus on what the idea is. Okay. And just so, I don't understand the idea. Okay. okay, maybe I'll skip the background and related work. Okay. And the uh, uh, synchronous model, I think most of the people here uh, already know that. And the capacity of point source MIMO link, which will be used in our scheduling algorithm. And uh, we, we uh, uh, I assume a lot of people here also know. And here, we I just want to point out that because there is a, 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 a trade-off between overhead and performance, and in in the in the uh, in this part of our work, we just assume the channel information is not available of the transmitter. And we um, so antenna selection uh, provides a simple scheme uh, for stream control. So uh, 
in the in the absence of interference, the uh, general capacity can be uh, maximized by uh, one one uh, equal power is put into each channel. So the transmitting power correlation matrix is just a scaled identity matrix. And in the in the case of strong interference, the number of interference streams uh, becomes crucial. So in this case, if there are k minus k one interference stream in the memory re receiver, then the optimal strategy is to excite k i out of k transmit antennas. And the k i transmitted streams are allocated equal power, and an independent data stream is transmitted from each power. So in this case, the transmitting power correlation matrix is uh, just a dynamic matrix with uh, non uh, non zero entries on, on the um, diagonal corresponds to the selected antennas. And also a super rate of interference modeling to which we will be using uh, in our scheduling algorithm. So maybe I'll, I'll skip this one and go to the So so for case that we see in that part if there's another MIMO link also transmitting the yes. first MIMO link with all the subscribers yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah. noise and noise. Yeah, we'll impact the transmitting value. Okay. And uh, first of all, we want to get the performance bound of the uh, network by uh, aggregate the heat maximization. So we I assume. Guess, I guess I sort of what the physical situation is with the network. Are you thinking about like a lot of many nodes and each has multiple antennas, transmit okay. antennas, multiple. So we uh, generally consider network always multiple. Uh, in here, we just, in this part, we just consider the wireless platform. We, con uh, we consider the multiple mixed access, uh, mixed access point. And uh, on each uh, access point, uh, there is only one radio and with multiple, with K antennas on each mixed access point. And uh, uh, and the trans transceiver uh, um, consists of radios, so it cannot transmit and uh, receive at the same time. So how do you decide who's transmitting and who's receiving when? So, so they're going to do forwarding, right, through the, the network. Of yes. Yeah. So it, it depends. It, it's dependent on scheduling. Okay. Yeah. So we assume all loads are equipped with the same number of antennas K and the, the transceivers are subject to half field fixed uh, constraint. And we also define an interface range Ri and assume interferers which Ri um, cause strong interference while interferers offsite cause uh, weak or no interference. So in in the case of strong interference, the number of anten receive antennas determines the number of streams that can receive including the useful data streams and the uh, interference streams which cause strong interference. So uh, we maximize a, a grid uh, gate utility under the constraint of real conservation, capacity constraint, radio constraint, and, and interference constraint. So this is a, a problem formulation. Uh, we, I do not go, uh, go into detail this, but we just, I, I just want to point out uh, the, uh, in the uh, capacity uh, constraint, uh, the capacity is in the right hand of the inequality sign is a point point in uh, capacity. This is just a simplified the formulation, but it kind of relax the constraint and make the performance bound uh, rules. So now we um, we propose a heuristic uh, scheduling algorithm called stream control to multiple access for uh, time slotted wireless network works. So we incorporate a congestion control component as the source load, uh, which determines the rate at which user injects data into the network to avoid congestion. And the main part of the SCFK is the scheduling, which is responsible for selecting links for active transmissions of selected flows. So scheduling consists of uh, two stages. Uh, the first stage is uh, channel assignment, and the second stage is uh, link pairing uh, by taking advantage of stream control. So there is a very important uh, data structure uh, in uh, each node, the per destination queue. The PD queues are maintained in each node, and the um, capital queue, the I, uh, at node I stores all the packets in node I with D as a destination. In this example, node I maintains two um, separate queues uh, to 
store packets uh, for P1 and P2 respectively. And we denote the uh, NID as the next hop, the load as next hop uh, towards B. So in this case, the NID1 should be J, the J, and NID2 should be LK. So the rate between this uh, this two uh, denoted accordingly. So the the urgency weight for the per destination queue will be the um, difference of the queue size as the two end loads of a link times the rate. So the congestion control is based on the agreed primal deal uh, algorithm proposed in 2005. And we use RS Toyota to denote the an exponential threat average of the injection rate into flow S. So in each time step, we must multiply RS Toyota by one minus beta. And whenever uh, uh, the source injects a packet into the network, it will increase uh, the RS Toyota by beta times LP. Well, LP is the packet size. So as the source, um, uh, if this condition is satisfied, uh, whenever a source re receives a packet from the upper layer, uh, it will inject the packet into the network if this condition is satisfied. Uh, otherwise, it, it does not inject the packet into the network. And the scheduling consists of two uh, stages. Uh, the first one is the channel assignment. So um, there is uh, some work so I just uh, explain this uh, here uh, briefly here. So we first form a set of all link channel pair E, I. So in this example, there are four links and two channels. So the total number of elements in the S will be eight. So the, the weight of E, I pair is defined as, uh, as similar as before, it's like just the Q difference uh, of Q size times the uh, REI, which is the transmission rate of E, when it works on channel I and using uh, and uses all its antennas for transmission. So we start with the M3 schedule and I for MIT for each channel I. And the, the first we search for EI pair with the largest weight defined here and add this link E to MI of T. So then if um, E prime is with uh, the interference with, with E, then we remove the E prime I pair from S because uh, because um, um, if E prime works on channel I, it will interfere with E. And if a node U exhausts its radio, then we re remove all the E prime I prime pairs. Well, E prime is a link incident on U, and I prime is a channel which has not been included in the channel assigned to U. And we repeat the above steps until S is empty. So in this example, if we assume channel one has been assigned to link one, then we have to remove uh, mm, this three because these three are the interference of uh, link one and on the same channel. So we just re remove this three. And also we need to remove this one on two on channel two because this node has only one radio and it has been assigned the uh, uh, channel one. So we have to um, remove this because it has no more radios to uh, receive more channels. And channel assignment results in a set of long interference links scheduled on each channel in a time slot, each uh, making full use of its antennas for transmission. So this uh, memo on the well scheduling scheme uh, is referred to as TDM <coughs> in, in the following um, uh, and we can uh, we uh, observe that better performance could be achieved by taking advantage of MIMO stream control. Uh, with uh, my stream control, we can uh, schedule interfering links uh, on the same channel, each using partial number partial number of antennas for transmission. To illustrate the benefits of MIMO stream control, we just give a very simple example. There are two links interfering with each other. If we use TDMA like one slot, link one transmit with all its 
the uh, antennas and in the left slot, they still transmit with all its uh, antennas. So the throughput in this scale would be 100k. And however, if we um, like choose two uh, uh, transmit two strings here, two strings here, and uh, uh, on each link, the uh, rate will be uh, 6k, then the total will be 130. So, this so, so in this situation, right, the, mm -hmm. the transmitter, the transmitters are A and B, right? Mm, this one, transmitter A and receiver B, yeah. and transmitter C and receiver so, B. So they, they could be some kind of station information, mm. like they could keep their antennas to, to, to construct uh, uh, signals that are orthogonal at the, you know, at the other receiver, mm. or or the the receivers could do some kind of interference in them yeah, in some kind of yeah, yeah. so but you're not you are doing that or you're not doing that? Oh I am doing that. Because uh, we we don't go into de into details of this but we just assume that if we uh, if there because there are four antennas and receiver, yeah. so the um, data uh, the useful data spent and in the first thing uh, the total number of this uh, two kinds of streams cannot be uh, greater than four. So if we assume, if we uh, if we assume uh, two streams are transmitted on this link, can result in 60k throughput, and uh, two streams transmitted on this link can uh, result in another 60k, 60k. Then the total throughput of this network would be 120. It could be 120. Basically, that's kind of like just trying to decide the right or not to do it or not, but based on the capacity. Okay, so the second stage of uh, our uh, algorithm is link pairing by taking advantage of this control. So in after the uh, first stage of channel assignment, there, there are some links which have not, have, have not been assigned a channel. So for each link E that has not been assigned a channel, in the first stage, stage a qualifying parent candidate in E prime is a link which satisfies the following two conditions. First, E prime is the only link within the interference range of E that has been scheduled to a given channel in the first stage. The second is no link has been paired with uh, E prime earlier in this stage. So because of these two conditions, there is at most one candidate on each channel. So then for each candidate link E prime, we need to determine the set of antennas to be used as a transmitter of E and E prime respectively to maximize the total weight. The, to the uh, weight here is um, is similar to the weight we have seen before, but the uh, rate becomes R E I A E because the um, because antennas selected by uh, the transmitters of the E and E prime will impact the uh, actual transmission rates of on these two links. So so um, all um, criteria is maximize uh, this total weight. And then we uh, select the most qualifying candidate, then is the candidate uh, which results in the largest and maximum total weight. Then um, pair the link E with this uh, uh, E prime. After pairing, uh, link E prime uh, may not be transmitted K MIMO streams as assumed in the first stage because at this point it has to share the same channel with link E. And here is the example of link pairing. So we use this uh, red lines to represent the channel assignment in the first stage. That means L1 is assigned to channel one and L2 uh, is assigned, uh, L2 is assigned to channel two and so on. And in the link pairing stage, because L5 has the uh, uh, largest weight, so it uh, got paired uh, first. Uh, it's, uh, it's paired with L4. And then for uh, this unsigned link L6, L1 and L, L1 and L3 allow qualifying candidates because both of them work, work on channel one. And L4 is not a qualifying candidate because it has already paired, been paired with L5. 
And L2 is the only important factor candidate because L2 satisfies on two conditions. And this uh, stream control can be easily extended to uh, multiple links. So in, uh, in extension for each link E that has not been assigned the channel in the first stage, uh, we denote the set of its uh, neighbor links, which is in the interference range uh, of itself that has been scheduled to channel I as Li of E. So then on each channel I, if Li, if the number of uh, links in Li is greater than K, that means the receiver is already overloaded, so there is no further processing for link uh, E. Otherwise, we need to determine the set of antennas to be used by the transmitter of E as well as of each link in Li of E to maximize the total weight. So then we select the most qualified candidate set and pair group, we can group group uh, link E with this set of links. And now we do some performance evaluation and we assume that loads are equipped with well half duplex radio capable of sweeping channels on a per snap basis and the same number of antennas K at all loads and we assume a very simple fast loss model uh, with alpha equal to four and uh, the preference uh, the distance uh, 10 meters as B B0 uh, B uh, 40 dB and we assume the bandwidth uh, 10 megahertz and we start maximum fairness of the system. So we first consider a single four link network and we assume there are two channels and each node is equal with two antennas and then we uh, uh, list uh, the per, uh, per flow throughput in the uh, right hand figure and the x axis in the flow uh, index. So in the picture, I guess it shows um, uh, uh, channel gain latency. Uh, it's red it's material, is it? In, in what way? Um, or the distribution. Like the complex scale? Yes. Okay. And we can see that uh, the uh, uh, SDM uh, uh, all, um, achieves better performance than PDM in terms of uh, per flow throughput. And then we consider the tree network, which is commonly used as a wireless mesh platform. And uh, uh, here we assume the zero is a gateway and other nodes are mesh routers. And all links are of a distance of uh, 200 meters. And there is a traffic flow from each mesh router to the gateway node zero. And then we um, uh, investigate the per uh, flow throughput uh, with two channels, two antennas, and two channels and four antennas. We can uh, see that uh, more channels used in the network apparently increase the throughput. And um, uh, due to the uh, uh, by taking advantage of uh, stream control, uh, SCML almost uh, the results of uh, SCML almost uh, doubled the uh, results of PDM in here, and it's uh, very close to the performance bound. And also to uh, uh, see more clearly uh, the impact of number of antennas on network performance, we change the um, number of antennas from one to six, and we can see that and to study the minimum flow throughput and the total network throughput. We can see that the throughput uh, in this case is almost a linear function of uh, number of antennas. And as, um, and similarly the- So, so what's the difference between blue, green, um, and red? The red one is the uh, uh, optimal, the uh, performance bound by uh, a great gate resilient maximization. And the red one is the stream control macrophysis we have proposed in this work. And this uh, uh, t this TDM scheme is that we just uh, use the channel assignment stage to do the scheduling. And also we study the per uh, network performance performance versus the number of channels, and we change the number of channels from one to four because more than four channels will be abundant in for this straight topology. And uh, um, 
present the uh, minimum flow throughput and total net network throughput in the uh, right uh, column figures. And then lastly, we consider a random topology. And we assume there are 20 uh, wireless nodes, uh, wireless mesh routers are randomly placed in a square area of 800 by 800 uh, square meters. And there are eight data flows with sources and destinations randomly selected. Here we use uh, eight different colors to represent the different flows with the arrows indicating the uh, direction of the flows. And then we repeat the um, experiment, each with a randomly generated channel matrix of about 50, 20 uh, times and um, uh, present the uh, per flow throughput here. So we can see uh, that in this case, uh, SDMA is still uh, outperform DDMA and uh, and a little bit lower than the uh, optimal values. So I, um, now I uh, would like to conclude my uh, work. Uh, in this work, we propose a new right. process. Okay. <laughs> I really thought I think I read it. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> the future work, in the future work, we plan to extend the association scheme for more general uh, uh, scenarios, uh, for example, in the presence of interstellar interference and multiple channels uh, used in the background. And also, we uh, would like to develop a load balancing mechanism working together with the associated scheme. And it would be interesting to study the optimal performance of Wi-Fi networks with interstellar interference present and multiple channels in the background. And also, uh, the, uh, we would like to implement the Distributed yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. so, so let's thank you.